Okay, we're now live. Hi, this is Elliot Fishman. Still in need of a haircut. Getting one away from Saturday. It's very hard to get a haircut appointment. It's very easy to get a CT appointment. It's pretty easy to get an R appointment. Very easy to get an ultrasound appointment. Plain films are really easy. Fluoroscopy is really easy. Getting a haircut with the right person at the right time is really, really hard. And I kind of screwed up. So anyway, um, great to be here and hope everybody is surviving. Uh, first week of March. I know some places it's really cold, like the Midwest, and some places it's really rainy, like in California. I saw a picture in Santa Barbara where the airport was knocked out by lightning, which they never get on the West Coast. Hopefully right now, wherever you are at uh, 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, things are good. And the topic this week is on the current state of the art of, uh, or current state of radiology technology training. Um, I've, you know, we run courses, and by the way, our next course is May 17th-19 in Nashville. It should be a great meeting. Uh, and we run a lot of courses, and we used to run courses specifically for technologists. Now, a lot of our courses, the techs come, and it's Dr. Tech Mix. But one of the things we always have said at Hopkins, and many of you say exactly the same thing, is the key to success of a radiology program, a radiology CT program, but... I know it's true in ultrasound, it's true in MR, everywhere, is really the quality of your technologists. At the end of the, t the day, the technologists are the people who are identified by your patient because they're the ones who bring the patients in and out of the room. They're the ones who speak to the patients. They're the ones who spend time with the patients, and that's true whether they're inpatients or they're outpatients. And so how they deal with the patient is often the thing that determines whether or not people like your practice and we always like to think perhaps that it's the report that makes all the difference in the world but you know the reality is is what the patient experiences is not your report and they may not know a good report from a bad report hopefully the referring doctors know that but at the end of the day the patients know how they experience the process and so we've spoken before about you know, a challenge institutions have, like a big institution like Hopkins. Parking is a challenge. Coming in the hospital, it's a big place. Finding where you need to go, things like that are always challenges. And one of the reasons outpatient centers work well is you can park outside, you can park for free, you walk 20 feet to the door of the scanner, things like that. So patients experience the whole process. But at the end of the day, you can't control the parking, perhaps, and you can't control uh, other processes, you can make sure the front desk is good, but the technologists really are the key. So you need to have really good, dedicated technologists. You can't have people who are just basically clicking the button to press to you know fill in the day. Um, the other thing is, we all know this that the quality of the study is dependent on the technologists. Now the techs are really good on protocols. We teach them. So the education of the technologist becomes very important. The technologist is the one who often chooses the contrast, looks at the creatinine. Many places, particularly with teleradiology, people don't even know what scanner they have or what's happening. They just get a bunch of images that come over the network. The techs are the ones making decisions. And whether it's during the day or during the night, the techs are the ones at the front line. And so you need to make sure at many levels, one, how they behave, is reflective of how you expect them to behave. And the patients will base what they think of you based on what they think of the technologists. So our best techs are polite, they're engaging, they try to comfort the patient. Almost everyone getting a scan is a little bit stressed because sometimes you're worried about potential bad news. Um, you know, I guess the exception might be even, I would say, OB ultrasound. But even then, you know, expected moms are always worried about something could be wrong. So anytime we do a study, there's always a concern for something bad. And so patients are a little bit perhaps um, not at their peak. They're a little bit nervous. They're a little bit stressed. And so it's very important that the technologist or whoever deals with the patient uh, is really comforting and really understands that. The second thing is the protocols. At the end of the day, a scanner is a scanner. You know, I can read really well if I have really good studies. So 
things like holding your breath, how we inject the contrast, the timing. We have all sorts of rules, and we teach the techs what to do, but at the end of the day, it's not just teaching, it's performance. You could teach me uh, how to play golf. The odds are I'm probably going to hit like 120. You can't have techs hitting 120. We need the techs you know, hitting in the 60s, the high 60s, you know, where sort of where Tiger Woods used to be way back when and sometimes still is. And so the education thing is what bothers me. Now, remember in the old days, there was a lot of education. The drug reps, and you could argue about drug reps visiting hospitals, but companies like Amersham and Winthrop and GE and Kodak and you name it would do these lunch and learns. And yes, I know they were doing it not out of the goodness of their heart. They wanted to sell you contrast. But the fact is the technologists learned a lot because there would be lectures that were designed for them, whether it was on managing contrast reactions or premedication or how to do a study or teaching anatomy. All those things were done. Um, now the drug companies don't come around anymore. As I mentioned, we ran meetings. We used to get 400 people for courses two, two times a year. But now, with money being cut back, physicians don't go to meetings. And I promise you, if physicians don't go to meetings, the technologists are not going to meetings. Now, you could say, well, you know, a meeting costs money. Uh, you can get CME credits online. There's many ways for techs to get CME credits. But I'm not talking about CME credits. Getting CME credits is not the same thing as learning something, okay? You can go, as a radiologist, you can go to the back of AJR and radiographics or anywhere else and get all the CME credits you want and never read the articles, right? Fill in the questions, you answer the questions. Most places, you don't even need the right answers to get CME credit. You just need to do the process. So let's be honest and let's not confuse education and training with getting CME credits. Most groups, all they care about is the techs get their 15 credits a year so the techs aren't uh, are getting their license renewed. That's all they care about. And what we're saying is, no, that's not good enough. The techs really need to undergo constant training. And yes, we have a training school for CT techs, and once they finish, they take the exam, they always pass it. But we always make the point that it takes two years after that for the techs to be really good, because there's a certain amount of experience and knowledge that you only could do by doing a lot of cases. It's not something that can be taught in school or during a few month or six month period, a five month period, where we have a tech school, it's really a constant learning process. So for us, that's very important. Now, CT is us, probably half the people who go to CT is us, particularly the Facebook side, are technologists. We have a great following with technologists. And I've read a lot of what people write to me and what we see ourselves. And as people get busier and busier, as radiologists get busier and busier here, as Teleradiology takes over where the radiologists aren't even in the hospital. The radiologist is somewhere sitting in their pajamas reading the films, or maybe they're not in their pajamas, maybe they're whatever they are. They're wearing their uh, their Nike cross trainers, perhaps. The point is they're not with the technologists. Most hospitals, the techs are somewhere, and the doctors are somewhere else, and maybe there's a few phone calls back and forth, but that's not the same thing as the radiologist being nearby the techs, which is what we do at Hopkins. But it becomes even a challenge there because a lot of radiologists don't like to speak to the techs. Not that they don't like them, but they just, they're very busy and they feel that they don't need to. So I'm saying that you need to. You need to have monthly meetings with the technologists, all the technologists. You need to figure out what the problems are, what you need for quality. Uh, you need to buy them bagels. I see John Biacchino, you feed us too well. Oh, if you feed us well too. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I got croissants this week. And it's unbelievable. I was buying bagels on the weekend, but the bagel store, there was something wrong. So I got croissants because someone told me about this croissant place. And some people complain, like John, <laughs> about the croissants, that croissants are too soft. It's not like bagels, and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then some other people complain, don't buy no more bagels, just buy croissants because their teeth don't work so good on bagels. They need to eat croissants. But anyway, that's a whole nother lecture about the advantages of croissants over bagels. Bagels versus croissants. But I think all seriousness, I think it's very important. And then Jenna, black and whites. Black and whites, this is not like a, a Paul McCartney song or Stevie Wonder with Paul McCartney. Remember, black and whites? Watch Steinfeld. There's a black and white episode. There's these black and white cookies. They're really gigantic cookies in New York. Black and white, you can get them 
almost any bakery in New York. They make small ones sometimes, but the big ones are very classic. I think it was someplace called Friedman's that made them. On, they went out of business last year on the Upper West Side, but there's many, many places. There's a very good place to get black and whites. If you're in the Penn Station, I can't think of the name of the bakery, but it's a bakery right by the inside Penn Station, and they have like two bakeries there. Excellent black and whites. Um, but anyway, um, research and publication help doctors to grow, but technologists has no growing exposure except appreciation verbally. No, no, I think one of the things, there are some journals that do uh, publish work from technologists, and technologists can submit to any journal. Remember, it's the quality, it's not your title that makes a big difference. So we've published articles with technologists, we've published articles with medical physicists, we've published articles with nursing. I think you just need to figure out a title and a topic and something you need to do. So if you, um, if you really want to write and do academic stuff, you could do academic publishing as a technologist. And I've seen a lot of techs do that. Many of the societies now, the uh, Rankin Ray, the, the uh, Cardiac, the JACC, has technologists on their board because it's very important that if you want to engage the technologists, you have technologists on the board telling you what technologists really need to know and what they're thinking. And not so much worrying perhaps as just what the radiologist thinks they need to know, which can perhaps be meaning, be well-meaning, but not exactly correct. Uh, so we're trying to figure out what ways of helping technologists. We do build out a lot of the CTSS for technologists. Some of it is a bit much perhaps, but um, we try to get things sort of in between a lot of the time, and we have a lot of material, particularly protocols and a lot of the anatomy that I think is very helpful to technologists. We do have our courses. Um, if people thought it was worthwhile, I would run a CT tech course only. We've done that in the past. It was very successful, but then it seemed to me that financially it wasn't very viable because there weren't enough techs going to meetings because the techs weren't supported by their departments and they weren't given time off. All the usual things that probably every one of you deals with. So I think it becomes very important to really figure out some strategy. In your own department, perhaps monthly meetings are important, going over protocols, perhaps you know, um, looking at where mistakes are made, speaking to the radiologist. You need honest feedback from the radiologist, what things aren't doing well. Are the cardiacs correct? Are the PEs not good? Is there problems with breathing on the study? Is there a problem with the timing of delivery of contrast? Are things too early or too late? Is the wrong protocol being done? What exactly is happening? And I think text, for better or worse, nobody wants to hear negative feedback. And you probably shouldn't be the type of person who you could do a thousand studies correct and then you get one wrong and they give you a hard time but didn't mention the thousand you got correct. We have people like that also. I won't mention by name, but I see some of my Hopkins people are listening in here and so they know who I'm talking about. Reality is reality, right? But I think at the end of the day, you really need to figure out some way of uh, really improving the process. I think in this busy time for both techs and doctors and nurses and everybody, I think the, the education piece is, is failing. I think it's true with doctors also. People aren't reading at night. They're not going to meetings. It's kind of like the attitude, I know enough. I know enough and I'm not going to learn anymore. You can't force me. You can't make me. I'm just perfect the way I am. We had this event. We took over a practice at Hopkins a couple years ago, and there were two technologists. We had an old scanner, and there were two techs. They were terrible, I thought. And I worked with them because we had covered this place for a number of years, and I, my opinion was to fire them. But, you know, our manager didn't want to fire anybody, and so he said, okay, what we'll do is we'll send you to our tech school for six months. We'll pay you your full salary. For six months, you'll just be a student and you'll be learning everything from scratch. And guess what? That seems like the greatest deal in the world, right? Both those techs refused. It proved I, I was right that they were stupid. Because anybody who turns down six months of education for free, you got to be kidding me, okay? And they said, we're not taking any, we're not going back to school. We know everything there is to know. There is nothing left to teach us. And I think when you think that, that's your first problem. And so they quit because they refused to know anything else. They knew enough. 
And I think the challenge is we all know enough, but enough isn't enough. That's like the Horst Schultes saying, you know, who founded the Ritz-Carlton, put the Ritz-Carlton together for 20 years, ran it. Good enough is not good enough. When you're the patient, you need excellence. You need that study to be perfect. Not that it was an okay study, that when I read it, it was okay. I'm much better when I have really good studies. When I, I was just reading a study in some very unusual case, perfectly timed arterial, perfectly timed venous, everything was perfect. I think I know what the diagnosis is, I'm not positive, but I had all the information I possibly could have to make the diagnosis. I looked back at some old scans. Of course, they were outside old scans. You know, the usual thing is everything bad is on the outside. But it was hard to make the diagnosis. Now, let's see. I can take a few questions. John Bikino said Pharaohs. There must be some bakery in New York or something. Uh, or probably Staten Island, maybe, or something. Let's see. Nick Crothers. From my experience, every patient, every scan, and every situation can be a learning experience. Good or bad, there can be something learned from every situation that technologist comes across. And that indeed is true, and that's true with everyone. This is, I think the idea of learning at any age, it's this constant learning. I would say I've been doing CT for more than a couple of years. I'm much better today than I was five years ago or 10 years ago. And I think a lot of this experience, this knowledge, it's better scanners, better protocols, but it's this constant learning. If you're not constantly learning, if you thought you knew everything and you don't need to learn anything else, you have a problem. And uh, that's the way of thinking about it. So I just wanted to bring this topic up and hopefully it'll, it'll encourage you and whether it's physicians or technologists to really rethink what you're doing, rethink what you need to do and come up with some strategy to making it happen. And of course you can come to our course. That's probably the number one strategy in the, in the world. Maybe the number one strategy in the universe. Maybe the number one strategy in the galaxy, not positive, but probably, probably it's a good it's a good thing to do. Anyway, I thank everybody for their attention, and uh, with that, if you have any great ideas for topics for us to cover, let us know. We'll be happy to do that. But if not, let me just press the button and tell you have a great day, and see you next time.